there's nothing comparable.
I was thinking to myself, I was like, I don't have a testimony. Um, there wasn't any big, huge lack of sin that I came away from. I grew up in church. And um, so I was like, I don't have testimony. What? That's, I don't have testimony. But I started writing things down. And God really began to bring back to memory the things that I had gone through, the situations that have been a part of my life, the situations that have made me who I am. So that's really what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. So, okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to read it because this is the third time that I've ever shared. So, Come on. Yeah. Okay, so I have people comment all the time about how they appreciate that I'm usually in a good mood. I'm upbeat, I'm laughing, I'm positive, I have joy, and all those, you know, fruits of the spirit that people talk about. <laughs> They're always like, you just, you have those things. And um, <coughs> that's who I've always been. That's who I was brought up to be. Um, you know, I was taught that the, that's just, that's how Christians act, that's how, that's how you act, that's how you are. You're, you're happy, and even when situations are not the best, you don't show that to the world. You, you show them the love of Christ through you. Um, but for a season, it was a front. It was a mask that I wore so people wouldn't see my pain. Um, I forgot that God said, come just as you are. He never said that we had to be perfect. I'm not perfect. For those of you that also I'm not perfect. Um, I never have been. But sometimes a person can get so caught up in trying to be perfect because that's what they think people expect of them, that you fail miserably at life. And um, your entire world falls apart. And that's kind of what happened about two years ago. And so um, <laughs> you were all here to live that, <laughs> that year, that season with me, most of you anyway. And so I kind of wanted to give you a background and just kind of let you know where it all started and why Satan was able to use that situation in my life. So, I'll start by giving giving a few, a few things to you. I grew up in church. My grandpa's a pastor, so I was born on a Tuesday, and I think I was in church the following Sunday. Um, I was saved at the age of five, and I was built on the Spirit at the age of eight. I have a huge family on both my mom and my dad's side. And I didn't learn, have to learn how to make friends. Because I, I had built in friends. <laughs> we did everything together. Um, they were my next door neighbors. We rode the bus together. We went to school together. They were my, not only my family, but they were my friends too. Um, I had the best childhood someone could possibly have until the age of five. A family member of mine was accused of molesting some of my cousins, my aunt, and several other girls in the church. I say accused because it was well past the time that anything could be done, and he wasn't he wasn't convicted. So that's why I say that's why I say accused. That situation in itself ripped my family apart. Um, it worked it to the point where things are still a bit uncomfortable at times. And I spent my childhood listening to people ridicule and condemn my mom for allowing me to still be a part of her sister's lives, her sister's and her, her sister's family's lives. Um, this is where my issues with rejection, insecurity, anxiety, and trust began. My cousins took the cue from their mom, and when they were ugly to my mom, my cousins were ugly to me. Um, I didn't understand what was going on, but the process of recovery is a lifelong journey. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that, but it's just now gotten to the point I was not, I'm 35 now, so you can do math. Um, but it's just now gotten to the point where family members are able to be in the same room with each other, much less speak. Um, so it took um, it took several family tragedies to even call them to be in the same room as me. During this time, back when, when I was at nine, my home life was great, 
but my world was shattered. The innocence of my childhood was gone because my parents had to explain what was going on to me. And my brother, they had to, they had to explain it. And they were upfront and honest, and they were very protective. And um, they told us, they, were, they said, this is what's going on. But I remember my mom saying that this is my sister, and I refused to not be marked for life. And they gave ground rules. And there were, there were rules and there were stipulations about when we went and did things, but it was to protect me and my brother. And um, while I still love my extended family, I was really confused. And um, I lived in like this bubble of chaos and confusion and pretty much disbelief. I couldn't understand why this had happened and why my family while the rest of my family couldn't take the key I guess from my mom and my grandparents and move past it. And I guess that's because it, it, it didn't happen to me. And but anyway, I I was I lived in, in complete chaos and confusion to the point where I withdrew into myself and made sure that I never stood out. Um to this day I don't deal well with conflict or confusion. And uh, as my, my friend Charlie don't tell me, I perfected the art of walking away instead of getting involved in drama. Um, as a teenager, okay. God brought two amazing people into my life. Charlie Don and Tiffany Wardwell suffer now, but um, they were my lifesavers. They showed me it was okay to be me and that everyone has problems. They became friends with my family as well because you couldn't be friends with me and not be friends with my family because even though even though our life was complete and utter chaos, yeah. we were still very connected. And so if you were my friend, you were their friend too. That's just how it worked. Um, so, but through that, through their friendship with my family, it allowed me to work through some of the issues I had with my cousins and how they treated me when we were younger. Me and Tiffany and Charlie were practically glued together at the hip, and we lived through each other's pain. Each one of us had different situations in our lives that were horrible and no one should ever have to live through. Okay. And uh, we lived through that pain together. We were support. We were each other's support system. And uh, to this day, we're still really good friends. I actually texted both of them tonight. I was like, "Please pray for me because I'm going way, way back with my testimony." And they both were like, you got this, you can do this. So, anyway. Um, I contemplated suicide several times during my teenage years, but to be honest, I would have never gone through with it. Um, there were two main reasons I didn't. One, I knew I would go to hell for murdering myself, and two, <laughs> I mean, I'm just being for all um, And two, I went to a crusade where I was able to talk to someone who didn't know my family or me. Um, they helped me reaffirm my walk with Christ, and later that summer at camp, God called me to a life of missions. I knew I was going to live overseas, not have to deal with my family drama. I was super excited. Um, during this time, God gave me a verse that has stayed with me, and any time I feel overwhelmed or like things are out of control, I remember Psalm 46, 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted on earth. This verse reminds me that I serve a big God who can calm any storm, even if I created it. So, this call to life of missions led me to Southwestern Assemblies of God University in 2001. Um, I lived in a Jesus bubble 24-7. I'm not kidding. It was a four-year span of constant prayer, discipleship, missions training, devotional, chapel, any kind of Bible-related activity, Christian-related activity, I was surrounded in that book. Um, there, they taught me how to serve. They taught us how to pray, how to worship, how to live a daily life of Christ. And um, it was a time in my life where God gave me a break from all the chaos and drama and allowed me to come out of my shell. Um, I made some amazing friends, and I was able to go pro through him. I also had a lot of first experiences while I was there. Three of those experiences changed my life. One reaffirmed the anxiety and the trust issues that I had. 
But the other two were really preparation for the life of ministry that God was calling me to. Um, okay, so my first year at Southwestern, I met I met this guy who uh, completely broke my heart. His name was Ryan, and he was very good at concealing his identity. He seemed like a decent guy, and even though he had been in the Teen Challenge program, I liked him. I didn't, I didn't find anything wrong with that. I was like, well, everybody has past, whatever. And um, he was a huge flirt, and it felt good to have someone like me. Over the first year at Southwestern, he led me to believe that he wanted to be in a relationship. I think he, married, he mentioned marriage once, which kind of weirded me out, but whatever. Um, but when we came back, yeah, when we came back from Christmas break, um, I found out he had a girlfriend back home who he had recently proposed to. And the funny thing is, I didn't hear it from anybody. I just knew. Um, I think God was preparing my heart for a huge hit. And yes, it hurt that he had lied to me and misled me. And those lies caused all that junk to resurface. But it didn't destroy me. Um, he left school at the end of that year to go home and get married. And um, anytime somebody brought it up, I kind of laughed it off, laughed it off, made fun of it. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, laughed it off, not a big deal. But I didn't forgive him, and I didn't forget. It was still something that bothered me a lot. And, um, Hi, Mommy. you know, anyway, my senior year, he came back to Southwestern. And was once again a member of Teen Challenge. And um, while well, I'm not busting out for all this stuff out there, long story short, um, because of some things that he had done, we had to work up with him. And he ended up getting himself back in the program. And so through that last year at Southwestern, I really was able to forgive him. And um, he apologized. And, you know, things I was able to forgive and forget and move past it. And, that was probably no other really things that happened. Um, like he tried to stop me, but whatever. Um, God, <laughs> God, um, God allowed that situation and that restoration to give me hope again, and to make me realize that just because people make mistakes doesn't mean that they're bad people. They just make mistakes. So um, God used it to make me a stronger person. And um, my second year at Southwestern, I experienced my first grief grief counseling situation. I was a resident assistant, and um, what that is is it's one person that lives on a hall of about 40 plus people, or college students, and um, I had about 40 freshmen and sophomore girls who lived on my hall. Um, I loved them, and they loved me. We lived life together, and we were really close. Um, but I remember being woken up in the middle of the night by my dorm pastor telling me that I needed to come to her apartment and uh, that she needed to talk to me. And I mean, it freaked me out because it's the middle of the night and I, I, God's given me that spirit of discernment. I knew something was wrong and so I was really, really freaked out. But my mom had come to visit that weekend. And because I, was a, because I was an RA, I had a room to myself. So my mom was asleep <laughs> on the bottom of, and I don't know if she even remembers me being woken up or anything, but she was there and I can tell you that that was a God thing. Because if my mom had not been there, I don't think I would have been able to handle it. Um, so, um, I knew something was wrong, but I was woken up to hear that one of my girls had been killed in a car wreck. My dorm pastor looked at me, a senior in college, and told me, go get her roommates, bring them to my apartment, but don't tell them. Um, she also told me that they had st they had stayed up to wait on their roommate to come back. So they were awake, so they were expecting her to walk in at any moment. So um, when I knocked on their door, and they saw that it was me, and it wasn't her, and then I said, hey guys, I need y'all to come downstairs with me. They knew something was wrong, and as all freshman girls in college do, they were, they were, they were like, they can handle it. And for lack of a better word, they really had to freak out on it. And uh, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say anything. Um, I had to take them to my door pastor's apartment, and um, I had to tell them that their roommate had been killed. And, uh, and then the next day, I had to tell all the girls in my home. 
It was possibly one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Um, she wasn't not one. I'm not saying anything to make her look bad. It was just it was a really horrible experience for me to have to go through. But it was an experience that God used to prepare me for where He's got me at now. Um, during all of these emotional events that took place, I was also dealing with the family drama in my head. Because of the situation with Ryan the very first year, Satan had used that to bring those, those feelings of rejection and all those issues and all that junk that I had. He had used them to bring, that they had brought all the feelings from the chaos and disorder and rejection and I'm not good enough back up. And um, while God was allowing me, while God was using this time to come a broken heart, Satan was trying to destroy me at the same time. I went through about a month-long depression where all I did was cry because I couldn't decide if my uncle had molested me too. Um, and I went back and forth, and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Did he? Did he not? I can't remember. I didn't dream. <laughs> um, I don't remember my dreams, ever. And... Um, so I had started having these dreams where just fear and anxiety and things were happening. And I know Satan was using that time where God was trying to, to restore me. Satan was using that to try and destroy me. Um, so I was going through these battles, and all I could do was cry. And my friends were like, well, so what is wrong with you? And all I could say is, I don't know. <laughs> and um, after about a month, I was finally like, okay, I'm done with this. And um, I finally concluded, I came to the conclusion that I didn't want or need to know that it wasn't important to my life and where I was at then. And I shut that door and I would never wonder again. And um, God closed that door of confusion. And I've completely forgiven my uncle. I've forgiven my family members for everything that's happened during that time. Um, and it's the best thing to be able to have that freedom to know that someone ripped your entire family apart, but yet you can say, you know what, I forgive you, and I hold no contempt towards you. It's it's the most great thing ever. Um, so, anyway, even though there were a lot of bad experiences, there were so many great experiences, too. Um, I was able to go on two mission trips. I led a prayer group. I found amazing friends who I'm still in contact today. And... I really feel that my time at Southwestern was a time of healing and a time of processing and a time of preparation. All of those experiences allowed God to open my eyes to the hurts and needs in my own life, but also the hurts and needs of others. Um, the one mission trip, the very first mission trip that I went on, I went to Hungary. And, no, I went to Romania, sorry. And um, anybody who grows up in a small town, Unless you go outside of that small town, you don't realize how sheltered you are. No matter what you go through here in Harkis, Texas, you don't realize how sheltered and how blessed you are to live in America. Um, the one distinct thing that stood out to me that really changed my perspective on life was we had just gotten back from visiting a, I think, a, a, an abandoned baby hospital, which is really a hospital where moms have their babies, and then they get up and they leave. They don't sign a birth certificate. They don't do anything. They just get up and leave, which means that those babies can't be adopted. So the nurses take them down to the basement, and during their off times, during their shift changes, their breaks, whatever, they go down, and they play with them, and they feed them, and they do things, but severe neglect. And so, um, like, I remember we were, you know, we were down there, we were hugging the babies, and we were holding them, and they told us, be very careful with this one because he's never, he's never been killed. Every time someone tries to touch him, he cries because it hurts. Because he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the feelings. He doesn't understand that it's a comforting touch. He just feels that. He feels that and it hurts him. So we had just gotten back from this experience and we're all a little emotional. And um, our missionaries are telling us that we're walking past the sewer. And she's like, hey, by the way, um, there are people that live down here. And um, me, little Melissa from Carthage, was like, what? There are people that live like, in the sewer. And, and so she was telling us a story that, about how 
the leader of the sewer gang, because, I mean, I guess that's what they call them, but the leader had come to her and said, hey, whenever this, your next group comes, I want them to come down to the sewer and visit us. So, we went down into the sewer. And I remember the little manhole thing was open, and everybody was going down, and every single person was going down. The anxiety was rising up and up and up until I couldn't do anything but cry. Because I realized how spoiled I was. And I realized all the privileges that I have because I'm not only because I'm American, but because I, well, yeah, because I'm an American, but all the privileges I have because I don't have to live in a sewer. And that experience right there <clears throat> confirmed and reaffirmed that God had called me to a mission field. Now, I was still expecting that I was going to go live overseas because that's what I wanted to do. And I was like, okay. So when I got back to Texas, I was like, yes, I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to teach and for three years because in Texas you can't be a school counselor unless you teach for three years. And so I was like, I'm going to teach for three years. I'm going to live overseas. And I'm not going to have to be around the drama of my family anymore. This is awesome. Let's do this. And God said, um, yeah, let's wait. So, um, I never really wanted to be a teacher, but like I said, in Texas, you have to teach for at least three years in order to be a school counselor. So, my plan was to teach for three years, lawfully overseas, get my master's, get married, have kids, and become a school counselor. I was ready to start my life. Um, however, I ended up getting a job right after graduation, teaching kindergarten, and I fell in love with it. I taught in Waxahachie for seven years and always thought about school counseling, but I never did anything about it. I loved the life that I had built. I was comfortable. I had friends. I attended a great church. I had a job that I absolutely adored. I had space for my family. I could love them while keeping in my distance because they couldn't hurt me if I wasn't around them. I thought I was living the life I was supposed to live. However, God started preparing me to move home. It started with a bad roommate situation, which caused panic attacks and the depression and the rejection issues to resurface, which, and these issues led to problems at work, which ended up with me counseling and taking anxiety medication. Um, this series of events led me to a great small group where I was able to really begin dealing with all the drama from my childhood and begin the healing process. For the first time in my life, I opened up and shared about my past with my mom and the people in my small group, and they were supportive. My mask started to come down, and God said, go home. And I said, no. <laughs> um, I argued with him, which only made me miserable. I started having issues with my money. I started to get really homesick, which was crazy because even though I had been away from home for 12 years, I had never been homesick. I loved living in Wasahatchee, but I got homesick. And I got really impressed. So while I was pitching my fit and was angry with him for a few months, I eventually stuck it up, I quit my job, and moved home. Now, for a teacher to just quit your job without having another job lined up is possibly the dumbest thing to do ever. Because you sign your contract at the end of the school year. So if you quit your job at the end of the school year, and you don't have another contract signed, you don't have a job. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, let's see what's happening here. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna try that. <coughs> and I did, I quit my job without having another one at home, and I packed my bag, and I moved. Um, so um, I knew that I had a plan and a purpose for my life, even though I wasn't really happy that he was making me come back home. So, I moved home in May of 2011, and it has been by far the hardest, the most rewarding season of my life. Um, at the age of 31, yeah, at the age of 31, I moved back to my parents, and, uh, I, began, yep, and I began a long-term sub-position, and um, where basically I was teaching someone else's class for them. And, um, then at Christmas time, that teacher came back and the school was like, 
hey, we have this position, it's an ace position, doesn't really pay a whole lot, but do you want it? And I said, yes, please, because I knew I needed a job. <laughs> so, um, because I was, a, I was an instructional aider, a paraprofessional, I um, had a lot of free time. So I started working on my master's degree in school counseling. And um, the next school year, I got a job at Carthage, and once again, I thought I was good to go. I was able to live in the same city with my family, and I was able to see firsthand how the healing that was taking place amongst them. I was happy. I didn't have any friends yet, and because Charlie had moved back, I started going to the 418, which is a ministry at the college, with her, and really the reason I started to go was because I knew I needed to be in church more. I knew I needed to have, because I was home, and those feelings of rejection and depression easily pulled up to God, I knew I needed to be, one, in God's presence more than setting lines and within us. And so I started going for my name, which eventually led to me going to the awakening, which was on Friday nights. And um, I was in leadership there. And even though our doctrinal beliefs weren't exactly the same, I thought I was okay. And I was like, all right, I got this. I'm strong enough. I can do this. So, uh, I'm calling it worth anyway. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, where was that? Okay, so then I met someone. And I, you know that word smitten, how it's kind of a weird word? I was. I was smitten. Um, which is completely ridiculous. But anyway, um, I, like, <laughs> you never really understand that he had me from hello until that situation happens to you, and you're like, oh, I get it now. Like, the minute we met, we hit it off. Um, it, it was crazy, but um, I thought he was an amazing guy. He was kind, and he was funny, and he was a really interesting person. Um, I fell really hard and really fast, and I knew that his past was different. I knew that he had come from a really rough past and that it was different from mine but I didn't care I actually appreciated it and um, he was sweet and he was kind to my family and he was nice to others and he was nice to me um, my mom and my dad liked him or at least they pretended to like him for my benefit um, and we were involved in some of the same things and I seriously thought he was the guy for me we connected on a really deep level and it felt like I had known him a whole lot and I'm not just and it's not like, oh, I feel like I know you all lot. It's like we connected, and we could finish each other's sentences. We were, I don't know, anyway, whatever. We were really close. Um, he was respectful or when we were around other people when we weren't. And everyone thought he was headed toward a relationship. But, take long story short, after a year of this friendship, or a better word would be flirtationship, he met someone who he liked more than me. And um, within a two-week time span, we were no longer friends. Um, he kept, he blew me off. And because I saw this unfold in front of my eyes, I pushed him away. I pushed everyone away. And I, I'm done. You know, I pushed everyone away, including my friends at church. And so, yeah, I um, withdrew back into myself. And I had to get back on anxiety medication. Uh, and literally went through for my family and my friends and went into a very, very deep depression and I completely lost myself. Um, while all of this was going on, I started to have problems at work. I know Satan was using specific people at my job to push me down even further into that depressive state and it worked for about a year. I lost my confidence. I began having panic attacks again. And not only did I let my students down, but I let myself down. And um, I really think I let God down too. Um, because for me, teaching is not just a job, it's a calling. Um, that's the mission field that God called me to. <laughs> and um, actually, school counseling, being a school counselor is that. But teaching was part of the process. And so, with all that being said, that two years ago, when that happened, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, I had to stop pretending to be perfect, and I had to get real with my creator. 
Satan tried everything in his power to defeat me. But God provided amazing, wonderful friends at church and a loving, close-knit family who were there for me. They prayed for me, they protected me, they comforted me, and they walked through this battle with me every step of the way. Throughout my entire life, God has never left my side. He has been my constant companion, comforter, refuge provider, and most of all, my strength. It took a little over a year for my heart to heal and for me to stand up and fight back against the fiery bears of doubt and despair Satan had been throwing at me. While I still have trust issues when it comes to letting people into my life, especially God, I've never felt more whole. I know that God used these situations to transform my heart and mind. God is showing me how much he loves and cares about the little details in my life each and every day. Um, I just got my first job as a school counselor, as most of you know, this year, and it's hard. It's really hard, but I'm excited for the next phase of my life. I'm not expecting it to be easy, but I am expecting and trusting God to continue to walk this crazy life journey with me. So, in conclusion, and it's being on, I guess, kind of, okay. In conclusion, I wanted to tell you my story for two reasons. One, because freedom comes with truth, and I've never shared my life story with people in Carthage. Um, and two, because I want you to know that God truly does make broken things beautiful. Um, for most of my life, I thought of myself as broken, damaged, and not worthy of being loved. But over the past year, God has turned my sadness into a joy that's full. He has turned my weeping into rejoicing, and he has taken my broken and torn and made apart and made it into a beautiful mosaic of his love and compassion. Um, I'm going to read you Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11. And I want you to think about the season you're in. Are you allowing God to work through it and make it a beautiful one? Are you wishing this season away? Um, are, are you wishing this season of your life away wondering why you have to go through it? Because that's where I was for a while. I was wishing my season of life away. And I questioned God at every turn. And even though I knew that it was a process that I had to go through, I was always saying, I don't want to. I don't want to live this life. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. So, while I'm getting her guitar, I'm going to go ahead and read this. Okay, so it says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. And a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything <coughs> beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Um, so this song, ever since I heard it a couple of years ago, I have fallen in love. And the last time I sang it was in Fort Petrie with um, someone who did not speak English. So <laughs> they played the piano and I sang. It was very interesting. If you would like to see the video, Jordan has it, I think. Um, awesome. So, um, yeah. Hello. And 
So high, here I am, and I trust your plan, though I'm
sun and all the ways of pain Then you were there before the world began And the long kingdoms of the long road Of the long wonder the world and the Of the long wealth and friends Right? Oh.